thanks so much for joining us this morning for what promises to be an interesting and illuminating talk. So we use psychology and data to show you what's really going on in a market, what's really motivating the people there. We build models to then show you how to predict and change that behavior. Like how do you stop somebody canceling an order when they've got their finger over the button? Up to broader things like propositions and pricing, all the way up to sort of strategic questions of market opportunity. You could call who, what, and how. So who is about mapping out market opportunity using psychology and data, quantifying and prioritizing those opportunities, and then showing very specifically the ways that you address that, even down to colors, words, images that you should be, be using. Uh, the what is about using that same scientific uh, principle to sharpen up propositions. So that could be broad product propositions, pricing, uh, and marketing assets. And then the how is about driving better interactions. So using cognitive bias and nudge, nudges, which you might have heard of, down customer journeys, whether they're sort of online, offline, or, or increasingly hybrid. How do you maintain a price premium using price psychology when everyone else is, is getting cheaper? How do you prime and nudge behavior in store? Um, how do you get people to adopt new ways of uh, payments and, and other behaviors? How do you apply the psychology of online ordering to persuade different groups of people to order online? How do you use psychology to drive app performance, whether that's download or, or usage within the app? An interesting project we're working on at the moment, how do you make non-alcoholic beer cool across different global drinking cultures? We are going to talk about the sort of tactics, tools, innovations um, that businesses are using to better know their customers, to understand them, and then obviously drive action off the back of that. We're trying to learn about our customers all the time. Um, and we're in a sector that is growing and emerging really fast. So we're doing lots of test and learn. Um, we have a group of beta testers. So we try and talk to our customers and, and find a group that will help us develop our products. Like, what are you looking for? What are your motivations? What is it that we can give you as, as the service provider? Although a lot of brands will say that we don't have enough data. Actually, we, we, we do have a lot of data. It's sometimes sitting in places that it's inaccessible or we don't know how to use more effectively. Another one was um, providing apps as well to um, dealers and distributors to help them better sell so we could understand how they were selling. Um, and we actually saw a 27% increase in sales with um, customers that adopted those apps. So that additional type of data in terms of how our customers doing their job and, um, and how we can help them do it better have been have proven to be really valuable, we've found and democratizing that data so that everyone has access to it and understands because there are lots of brilliant people in every company and lots of people that can look at it in a, from a different perspective. Um, so they can, they can find things that are actionable and come up with good suggestions of how to improve business results from it. If you want to be customer centric, it's not just the job of marketing, it's a whole organization. So how do you bring that data alive? How do you visualize it? I loved some of the, the examples in the presentation today. I'm like, oh, that, that sort of person's really come alive for me. How do we do that and feed that um, through the organization in a way that, that action can come from it? We bring in new technology and, and, and the vendors are really good at selling you the technology and it's gonna be a silver bullet. Uh, but they're actually, it's, it's, a, it's a form of um, cruel optimism because they, they sell you this thing and you can't think that's going to solve all of our problems. And you end, up, you end up trying to serve the tool rather than what you're trying to do, which, which is serve the customer. And so what, at ESA, what we did was before we went anywhere near the technology, it was actually we started to understand the customer better. So actually, what was the customer journey? What were their pain points? And what that allowed us to do was to kind of go, right, so now we know what the pain points are. What are the needs and wants of our customers at different points in that journey? What's the data that we need to collect? And what's the technology that we need to fit into this to deliver on that? And I think that too many brands, even, even within, even within the, the group now, think about technology first. And because it's working well in, in, in Avon, Mexico, we should be doing the same thing in, in, in Avon, Poland, without thinking about the customer and how that and how that how that varies. You, the use of data is, you know, we, we get a lot of social listening, a lot of um, digital data, Google Analytics, etc. But, you know, if, if you follow all of the advice, for example, that Facebook gives you, you're, you're going to end up with a six second video with four brand messages where you have to get everything across in the first three seconds. And it's, you know, at some point you have to interpret that data and, and look at a human and, and just try to advertise to that human. We, we have a survey to get a, a home 
Electric charger installed, you answer a lot of questions about your property, you take a lot of pictures. Uh, it's not the easiest journey uh, because there's a lot involved in making sure that it's safe in your house with, with power. And after you've completed this long survey, we then have a drop off looking at our data to the payment stage. So why would you go through all of that and then just not check out? So we surveyed our customers to find out why, and they just literally wanted more reassurance about the installation process and what happens next. And I think it's, again, remembering you're dealing with real people rather than data. I'm group head of CRM and personalization, but I hate the word personalization because I think it's a very one-way street. In the retail space, we use the data um, so that our consultants can have a much more informed conversation with their customers because actually it's a, it's a consultant in the store that knows the customer even better than we do. We use data to try and inform and, and, and help rather than and push a, a customer in a particular direction. But we know that you always pay with Klarna, so why do we put Klarna down as the fifth option for you when we know that to make your transaction easy it should be at the top of that, that list of things. I really like the Candy Space model. Um, I like considering the sweet spot. I think that's really important. It's like, how, what are our commercial objectives and how does that actually overlap with what the customer is looking for? And I think if we focus on that where we all win, I think that is really important. And then matching how our business can deliver against those so that we have the happy sweet spot. Finally, I guess I want to invite you all to make the same sort of reckless prediction that I did. So given the changes that you can see in your businesses, uh, the change in nature of the relationship between brands and customers, the demise of third party cookies, what is it going to look like in five years time? A lot of brands have spent the last five years trying to actually put the technology behind what they're trying to deliver. And I think if some of those brands can get the right together in terms of getting the te technology right and the, the data right, then I think that the next five years um, won't be as embarrassing as it, the last five years have been for you, uh, Matt. Yeah, that's a much more considered prediction than mine. <laughs> Thank you. That trust is so, so important. And if you, if you aren't transparent, if you aren't truthful, it is coming to the forefront. You can't hide anymore. I think we'll live in a world where our data is more organised because we'll <coughs> appreciate the value of first party data a lot more than we do today. So you, there are all these studies that kind of go at 70% of customers want to be personal, have personalised comms and they'll spend more money with you if, if it's personalised. We actually don't spend enough time talking to consumers and think about what, what do you mean by personalisation and being personal. So in reality, what, what do you want from us rather than us thinking, well, we need to give them this shade of mascara because that's because it, it's aligned with what other people have bought. So I think that we need to spend more time with consumers asking them what personalization means and then things will look brighter in five years' time. Really opens up some different ways in which we can perhaps target our audiences or retarget our audiences, especially with things like nudges and the right use of language in that and that resonates more to encourage people to take the right steps that you want them to convert. How important it is to look at all of your first party data, to make sure that we're thinking about what the motivation is for the customer and to see if we can look at the different psychology behind customer decisions so that we can nudge them in the right way and talk to them in a way that resonates with them so that we can encourage customers to go further on their journey with us. Quite often businesses focus far too much on technology being the silver bullet rather than looking at business process and people and I think we need to take often take a step back and don't think that that is the panacea. We've all got loads and loads of data, we've got data from our organic traffic, data from all our paid media, data from our digital platforms and products, but the most important thing is not to forget the human side of it. What's coming down the line in terms of sort of first party, so all the challenges that are going to come with that, so the key understanding is around how behaviour changes data and vice versa. So I think for us it's like really, really interesting where it's going in the future. I really love the idea of psychological nudges and there was one really brilliant example that um, they showed which was a, an NHS, I think, SMS message and they'd identified that even in those few words of copy there were like seven different triggers that helped drive the action that they wanted to drive. What we've come away with learning is, is that our thinking around behavioural science being important for onboarding as you come into the product uh, means that we can use that sort of information from the from the ground up rather than patching on as a marketing strategy later we need to listen to the client we need to and the end client the customer we need to put them in a place where they can feel the value exchange get 
into the sweet spot of the brand with which they're engaging. Um, but we can do that better and more incisively by using different tools um, and by asking the question and trying to help the brands we work with thereby build trust.